So today we're going to be covering some more material on testing, um, material of conceptual substance. And, and this introduces some principles that can aid you with this task that I previously emphasized of getting the greatest bang for the buck from testing. And of testing that whilst it can never be exhaustive, can at least be thoughtful and focused on high risk criteria or, or situations which are more likely to elicit identify failures within your your system so we're going to dive in to some slides here and and uh, i'm going to even within them um try to move fairly quickly um and and get to the main topic that i'd like to use as the center point of discussion over the next two lectures, including today, namely coverage testing, okay? Different forms of coverage testing, different levels of, of breadth and uh, scope of coverage testing. Okay, so we had talked last time, I've gone over some really sub slides, um, you know, a number of times. We talked about elements of test case design, the use of test cases at various levels, uh, absolutely key notions with which you're familiar, the use of test cases that are not just manual, uh, valuable as those are, but are also automated, and the automated ones that can uh, that can take place either programmatically or through the UI, right? Um, here, uh, for all those methods, manual, automated, exploratory, pre-planned, programmatic, UI-based, we can make use of a bunch of principles for selecting test cases consciously, deliberately selecting them to yield the highest gain, the highest bang for the buck, as I mentioned. Consciously aware of the fact that there's opportunity cost at issue that choosing a test A can mean not testing B and C, right? And we talked about some simple curious or some simple principles, such as identifying equivalence classes, right? Remember that? Equivalence classes of inputs, right? Um, and uh, for identifying boundary values between such equivalence classes when it makes sense, right? So if we we're trying to find one string and another, we might have a set of test cases that relate to case issues, you know, to what degree um, we, uh, we're we going to be uh, able to find things in lowercase in a string that's uppercase, if it's incorrectly doing that. Make sure that it recognizes things of different case are different. Um, or we might have some that are focused on cases where the string that you're trying to find inside another string is actually bigger than the string you're trying to find it in, right? You're looking for foo inside a string like fo or f, and it's it's too big to, to find it, right? Or another where there's a set of repeats. You're looking for foo in this one, this one has many occurrences of, of foo in it, and you want to make sure it returns the first of them, right? Or where there's overlapping ones, right? Where you're looking for BAB, um, and you have a string you're trying to find it in which you're trying to find it, a BABA, BABA, or something along those lines. In any case, that has that several overlapping ones. You don't want to, um, and you want to take that into account, make sure it didn't didn't mess it up or or with substring occurrence that you're counting all of them. So we 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 talked about this notion of equivalence classes and then boundary values. With the reflection on boundary values is, you know, at, at a crude level, we often have off by one errors. That's a very common type of error. It's one of the most common types. I don't know how many times in my life it bit me. Um, and I suspect it's the same for everyone in the room. And boundary values help us deal with these borderline cases that either because of miscommunication or mistakes in the design 
or mistakes in the implementation of the design. We we didn't get the the system to to have the right logic, right? And we might find that with a test. And we noted that you know in different cases the the flavor of the equivalence classes what what characteristics they group are different. Sometimes we group equivalence classes by things that elicit similar logical conditions. Other cases, we expect them to yield similar error messages, right? Similar types of error conditions um, or similar input output behavior of our system more generally, et cetera. So we talked about those principles of, of equivalence classes and boundary objects. And you know, I had briefly noted that there were some visual constructs, some what a visual, kind of a mathematical structure that we can use to spot these things. You know, we can create tables of possibilities and systematically go through rows of these tables of possibilities here with respect to um issues of you know how we handle an accident based on the number of claims a person has had, their age, and how much we've changed their premium, whether we send them a warning or whether we cancel their policy because they're deemed too risky. Or we could draw it out as a decision tree and we want to, or excuse me, a tree, and we want to test each of these leaves of the tree, which represent different scenarios, different classes that are handled. So here, you know, we're, the idea is that we want to be systematic, right? We don't want to, we can't really pass the red face test. Tell someone we've seriously tested this system for handling insurance claims if we haven't tested all these cases, at least once. And we might te test each of them a couple of times, right? 25 or younger, maybe we try it with age 18, maybe we try it with an age below 18, maybe we try it with 25 itself, right, 24. But at least we want to test these cases at some level, and we want to test boundaries between them. And it would be a fool's errand to put all our effort into one of these alone, right? To just say, oh, yeah, we're only going to test one of these. We're, we're not doing our homework in a, in a clear way, right? So we're doing systematic testing, right? Um, now, there's a very weak form of systematic testing that tests each value um, each input value or equivalence class exactly um, exactly once. It's a it's a um, you know we only uh, we only tested uh, a single time. So here um, we might consider, for example, something like like um, this uh, where we have um, eh, there's not a great example, but maybe maybe we have a function here which takes in a Boolean as its first uh, value and takes in a string, which if the Boolean is true, um, uh, is, is used, if it's true or false, it's used in a different way. Maybe it's trying to find a certain substring in a case sensitive way if the Boolean is true in a case insensitive way if it's false, right? And so we could test this function Take in a Boolean and a string with different values of the Boolean, right? One value where it's true, one value where it's false, where it's false, and different possible values of the string, right? Different kind of equivalence classes. But the key thing here is that for this kind of naive testing, we're going to be dealing with each in isolation. And what I want to pose before you now is a question. Suppose we have multiple inputs. So we have two, we have a function that takes two arguments, two, you know, two formal parameters, right? One that's a Boolean, one that's a string. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that change the situation? We okay, maybe we want to test each possible value of the string and each possible or each possible value of the Boolean, and then some representative strings. But do we want to consider both together? Like maybe we want to consider for the Boolean being true, being, is case sensitive, make it case sensitive. We want to test with different strings than when the Boolean's false, when it's not case sensitive, right? 
If we want it to be case sensitive, we want to make sure it's behaving in a case sensitive way. So we'll give it different strengths, right? If if we don't want it to be case sensitive, possibly we would we would uh, test it with some additional possibilities. Um, so some some other possibilities. The the question in general here is, how do we deal with multiple inputs? If we want to think about each value in isolation, we'll get a certain distance, um, but we'll be leaving money on the table um, in terms of values which need to be considered together. So for example, here, uh, where we have start and final, these two are linked. How are they linked? When I say start, the value start, the index start and the index final are at some level linked together that it behooves you to think about one when you're thinking about the other. In what sense? Like, why would we? Yes, Matthew. Because their conditions dictate a relationship. Yeah, exactly. The conditions dictate a relationship. The zero is less than or equal to start, and, and which is itself less than or equal to final. There's a relationship between them. So if you're testing it with start being zero, um, you you might in in a, in a given string, maybe it's the string foobar, you, you might want to have a value of final that you know uh, is up to the length of foobar six or or foobar minus one, right? Uh, five. Um, maybe you also want to test six to make sure how does it handle a value that's just out of range. And you want to test zero um, because you know it's the value of start. So here we're we're not reasoning about each in isolation. We're reasoning about them together. And and the question is, in general, how do we how do we test something which is different inputs? Or maybe you're dealing with a field, a web form, right? If you're dealing with a web form, it is different as name, date of birth, um, you know, address, right, uh, city, country. And you want to make sure that this web form works well. Um, you have these different inputs, right? There, they're less maybe dependent on one another, although country might determine what cities are applicable. But you can't possibly check all possible values of this. And in general, if we have, let's suppose we have, I want you to go through the mathematics of this. So suppose we have a function, we'll call it f, and it takes in, for example, a Boolean as its first uh, first uh, value, and then maybe it takes in uh, a, uh, a province, right? Um, as its as its second value. How many how many possible combinations of values are of this? Anyone? Yes. So for the Boolean, well, there is only two. Two. For the province, well, it depends which country. So if it is Canada, it will be... Ten. Uh, ten. 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 Yeah, right. I think that's right. Uh, um, ten. Um, and uh, if we consider, if we want to consider all possible combinations, how many would we have them? Ten, two. So it's... Sorry, ten times two, right? Yeah, I mean, no, it's good to think these things through. Um, the, these are good things to reflect on. Um, uh, if you add mappings from Tony, Tony knows where I could go with this. If you add functions from booleans to provinces, for each boolean you get a province. Um. Uh, then you would get 10 times 10, so 10 to the 2, right? Because for true, which province you get? For false, which province you get? And you get all combinations in its 10 squared, as Tony knows. Uh, uh, but here, it's a pair of them. You could have either of two values here, and you could have any of the 10 values here. So there's going to be for the first one, right? Bool being false, you have each of the provinces. You want me to list them? Newfoundland, Labrador, you know, PEI, 
uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, Quebec, et cetera, right? And then you have it with bool being true, right? So it's this times this. And in general, the number of combinations goes up multiplicatively. What do I mean by multiplicatively? So, so suppose the first one takes, um, I'm going to use, use this. Uh, the first one is a set of possible values, X sub i. This is a set, like for bool, true, false. It'll be two, right? This means the size of the set, the cardinality of the set. Uh -huh. And so, so for true, false, it'll be true. For provinces, we have some set, right? So I'll call this X sub one. Uh, for provinces, we have 10, right? So X sub two is the set of all provinces. I'll go over in the West, right? Uh, British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, et cetera, right? Um, if we had these, um, uh, for, for the two here, we have the multiplication of these two as the number of possibilities. Do you get that? For each possible value of X1, we have all the possibilities of X2, right? So we have X1 being true, and are being false, and then all the provinces, and then at, uh, x1 being true, and then all the provinces. So it's, it's it would be two times 10. But in general, if we had more, more formal parameters, right? C, or, or what have you, if they were all independent, we'd have like times x3, et cetera. And the, right, the way we write this, I don't know if you, will you have pi? I, I don't mean the, I don't mean like raspberry, blueberry pie and, <laughs> and pumpkin pie and, and so on. Uh, although I'm rather partial to said delicacy. So I'll, I'll know, but no, it's, it's um, we, we have pie meaning the product. P is for product. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the product of these things. So imagine that each of these were two of size two, you had a bool, and then another bool, and then another bool, and another bool. And then, suppose they were independent of each other. One value for the first, one value for the second, one value for the third. Um, how would this grow? If we have n of them, how many, how many possibilities would there be? Two to the n. Was that Tony back there? Yes. Awesome. Two to the n, right? Two to the n. Mm -hmm. For each of the n values, we have either true or false. We have n booleans, right? For each of those n booleans, we have either true or false. So we have like a function from n to two. Okay, Tony knows I could, I could wax uh, eloquent on these things, but I'm not going to go that direction, Tony. Um, yeah, Juan. So that's the case for booleans, right? For booleans. Now let's suppose that each of these were ten of size 10, what would it be then? 10 to the n. 10 to the n. If, if n is like six, is that big or small? What's 10 to the six? <laughs> it's big, but it's a very particular big number that in Canada we call a million. Yeah. Hmm? What's two to the six? Oh, come on. You can't graduate without knowing that. <laughs> can't graduate without knowing that. 64. Darn right it is. Damn straight. Um, Okay, you're a different generation, okay? Um, I can never forget it. I can never forget the 64K limit either. Um, that used to limit us on, on programming. It's 64, 768 bytes to deal with. It's all we had in the world. And we make good use of them, I'll tell you that. Um, in any case, this number goes up really quickly. So if you wanted to check all possible combinations of, of n values, even if they only had two here, right? Let's suppose we had 
10 possibilities in a web form, 10 different fields, each of which had only two possibilities. We'd have two to the 10th, which is what? But don't tell me you don't know two to the 10th. You got to know two to the 10th. One or two, four, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why two to the 20th is about a million. Oh, you didn't know that? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, no, seven. <laughs> Um, so, so this number rises really quick. It goes up really quickly. And this may not sound like, like you could imagine testing a function programmatically for different combinations of values. But if you have a web form, submitting it like a thousand times starts to be pretty expensive. If you had to test, you know, your system with different fonts and, and you know, different screen sizes and different types of graphics or whatever. This is an old slide, but the basic idea is if you're doing hardware testing, you're testing if your system, that's an embedded system under different configurations, you wanna be really careful about how many test cases you try to put into place. Each of these may involve manual configuration or at least time consuming procurement of a certain virtual machine for testing it on this Android device via that one. Are you folks familiar like with, um, there are these testing libraries that have um, emulators for all these different Android devices, right? Samsung, LG, right? Uh, Pix uh, the Google, like with the Pixel, right? Um, uh, you have many different manufacturers of, of these devices. And you might want to make sure your app runs really well on each of these. Huawei, you want to make sure it doesn't have a problem with Huawei devices, right? Uh, Xiaomi or what have you. And and so uh, if you have if you have um, some expense in trying different combinations, you're going to be wanting to be careful about how many combinations you use. So the idea here is if you have too many combinations, if you have from and to and subject and has the words and doesn't, you know, these are like search search um, parameters on in your mail browser for your mail, right? You, you want to be conscious about like what combinations do we choose? You could you could just say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna search for you know, date within the past day, and we're going to search once for date within the past three days, once for within the last week, make sure each of these works properly. You don't want to do that, right? If you're searching mail, you want to make sure it, if it offers this possibility to search for mail with this level of recency within the past day, past week, or whatever, you want to check each of those, right? You can't pass, pass the red face test without saying you've checked each of them. But maybe you want to make sure that works okay with looking for things of a certain size or whether it has an attachment, right? So maybe, maybe yes, you want to check each of these, but maybe you want to check it with an attachment or, or check it also, does it, does it work properly when we consider the size of it, right? Um, or, or things with an empty subject and things with a filled in subject. So if we want to test our systems in general, we want to give thought about combinations, maybe because they're logically connected, like that start end, the start final, remember that one, the, the one, or maybe because they might somehow interfere with each other. Maybe, you know, maybe searching by day might use some logic that needs to play nicely with searching by size of the attachment or, or with, you know, the, um, uh, the words that are included in it or what have you, because maybe older messages are stored in a different place. And you want to be conscious about what combination of possibilities you want to look at, okay? So how do we handle this? Well, look, one thing we could do is just blindly say, we will test each of these values separately. And at least if, if we have one test with one day and one test with three days and one test with a week and one test with two weeks, we consider ourselves golden. And then we say, we'll test it at least one test with has attachment and one test without, right? And at least one test with subject filled in and one test with it blank, at least one of those for each of those. And we'll consider ourselves okay. The problem is 
What does it miss? What does that miss? What does that miss? I mentioned it just a minute ago. What does it miss if we do that? If we just say, we'll just consider each in isolation, as long as we hit, hit each possible condition for that, we'll consider ourselves good. What does it miss? Yes, Tony. Uh, it means the uh, relationship between no two. Yeah, this is the relationship. Sometimes it's all about the relationships, as Matthew said earlier, right? It's all about, wait a minute, you have to, and choosing values of, Finish to pick. You want to pick what you want to be thinking about what value start and use, or vice versa, right? Or to pick values of start and finish for where to look in a string to extract the substring, you want to consider what string you have, right? So generally, the minimum we want to do is test different possibilities of each in isolation, but often it's a pretty weak medicine. We don't get nearly as far doing that we rule out a lot of important, or testing a lot of important criteria or conditions. So this is this idea that like, test each possible value in isol of each field in isolation, not considering the values of other fields, it tends not to work very well. Often our criteria count on multiple values. The sensible criteria, the important criteria, the risky criteria to test to make sure it works properly, count on different criteria. Do you get that sense? Yes, Ardalan. Uh, the question I had was, can we reduce this issue? Because we kind of go with everything for these four years. We can't go with all possible values generally, can we but we can't go in isolation. Can we go with random ones? I want the random ones. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll get to that. I have a slide on that, okay? um, uh, So, we have different ways of dealing with this. And you're right that Monte Carlo type, type techniques, which draw values of random distribution, are a way, and actually a pretty good way, of dealing with the curse of dimensionality in, in a pretty good way. Um, but I want to introduce something called orthogonal arrays. Okay. So what I said is look, the, the weakest medicine is we test each criteria we want for each value in isolation, we just say, we'll hit it once. We hit once where the subject, at least once where the subject is filled in, at least once where it's not, it has no words in. At least once where we search within a day, at least once within three days, at least once within a week. That's the weakest we can do. And generally it doesn't cut it. Generally it doesn't get us the criteria we want. So what's the next level up from that? Well, it's something called, um, it's something that considers pairs of values. And the idea here is really important. I don't care whether you're testing a function or whether, like this one, which happens to have two arguments, or whether you're testing, you know, how well does your system play with, with Chrome versus Chromium versus, you know, uh, Firefox. Right versus Safari, um, on the one hand, and then how does it do with uh, a configuration that's on a small screen device, like a smartphone versus a larger screen device? Often problems come up in pairs. What I mean is, it's not that it just doesn't work at all for one day for searching within the last day or searching at all within one year. It's just that it may break. When it's a particular one of these, not in isolation, but together we're searching for attachments, or together we're searching for, you know, content of that message. Things often break when there's combinations of value. It's not that they don't ever break where the value in isolation, you know, considered in isolation. Yeah, I mean, it can happen. But the next most common thing is it happens with combinations. So I'm testing it on a smartphone with, you know, with Chromium or something like that, or I'm testing it on a smartphone with um, uh, with a interface that uses the dark theme. And then I can't see my, you know, properly my window um, that my web application has created. I can't see the items on it. So what I'm saying is that often problems come up at, at comb for combinations of values. Not always, but often. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, 
I don't want to lose track of the fact this logic applies at different levels. In your very projects, if I look at the risks that materialize in your projects, a lot of them were pairwise risks. Can you can you think of any examples? I can think of some examples from, from across your projects of it's not that one technology didn't work at all. It just it didn't play nicely with another technology. Give me an example. Yeah, Matthew. <laughs> okay, beat, but beat with jest, for example. Log for JS. Log for JS. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Um, what's that? Yes, indeed. Um, any other combinations, things that didn't play nicely together? Yes, Jesse. Could be something like time. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Or the tasks that you had together with how tight your schedule is. Like they might be, like no problem taking on the tasks if you didn't have to worry about your schedule. No problem, you know, having the schedule if you don't have a ton of work to do for your project. But if you have both together, you know, that that it can be a problem. Yes, uh, Arduin. Uh, learning and experience. So the big reason I'm saying this is because you might not know something, but you have experience in other language that you can learn very fast. Whereas you might need to learn what I know so you don't have a lot of experience so that you actually Okay, yeah, yeah, that, that's right. So if you don't have a lot of experience, you might not learn. But I, I do want to bring this back though to the issue of testing. You know, like technologies did not play nicely together. Byte might be a, a nice technology but it doesn't play together nicely with this set of technologies, right? It's a pairwise thing. It's not that Byte is forever demonically not working, at least, okay, okay maybe maybe you got to freak me on that. But I think it's that it doesn't play nicely with, with a, a set of important technologies, including Jest, but also including Log4j, it sounds like. Yes, um, um, Mitchell. Okay, good, good. So, you know, is it possible to um, to do testing with VR? Yeah. Is it possible to do automated testing if you don't have to worry about VR? Yeah. But when you put the two together, you've got a really serious bunch of constraints, right? Maybe it means for VR, you need to use a lot of at the least human in the loop testing. And so, on. so there's a lot of cases we, we deal with them all the time. This doesn't play nicely with that. It's not that either one is bad. It's just they don't play nicely together. Mm -hmm. um, and th there are cases even at the human level, right? Where people in the project, <laughs> this person contributes a lot to that one, but together, together they may not be a great team. Um, this can happen. So a lot of things are pairwise issues. So if we're looking for bugs, if we want bang for the buck, if we want to test judiciously, consciously, systematically, it behooves us. It behooves us. It behooves us. To test pairwise on a systematic level. And often you can test all possible combinations of equivalence classes for A and combined with pairs, uh, you know, pairwise, make sure you test all pairs of equivalence classes for A and equivalence classes for B um, without having all combinations of possible values across N. So the idea of equivalent of orthogonal arrays is every pair of values is, is tested, even though all combinations of possible values are not nearly tested. So suppose we have a situation, forgive the antiquity of this. Um, there was an age where Netscape walked upon the world. I remember you saying Netscape in 1993. It was, it was my first experience browsing. I think I, uh, well, anyway, I'm on, I'm on <laughs> the more term. 
But okay, suppose you want to choose different browsers. This, this could be a criteria for modern systems, but it'll be a different set of browsers, right? You don't have IE in that state. You might have Chromium and Chrome and Firefox and Safari, right? Um, maybe you have certain plugins that you want to make sure it works well with uh, on a certain server, backend server, and a certain operating system. And you have different operating systems now. But the same point is you want to make sure you're your software plays nicely with these things. In testing all possible combinations, all possible browsers, with all possible plugins, with all possible services, all possible operating systems may not be in the often. It might involve a lot of manual configuration of different servers, or at least a lot of virtual boxes that you have to configure. So instead, what you do is pairwise exhausting. The issue is not that you have all possible combinations, but you have every pair. When I say every pair, possible pair, I mean every every combination of browser with applicable plugins is checked. Every pair of browser with appropriate servers is checked. But not every pair of browser and plugin and server is checked. It's pair one. It's we, we check all things, every browser and every operating system pair that are legitimate are checked. But so are every plugin and every server, and every plugin and every operating system together, and every server and every operating system does a pair to test them. There's at least one test case to test that pair. Now, some of these test cases will overlap. Maybe you can test. IIS with Win 2000. Yeah, that was the thing. Um, you know, to get at the same time, you test browser uh, Netscape 6.2 with IIS. You'd be accomplishing several pairs right there in this one test case. Test case one, you'd be testing several pairs of things Netscape with none, plugin, Netscape with IIS, Netscape with Win 2000, but also a pair of server. You know, IIS with, with Win 2000 and no plugin with Win 2000. But every, if you consider all the test cases, every pair of them is tested at least once. You get that notion. So it's, it's not that only pairs with browsers are tested. No, every pair. So if you consider different columns here, different fields, right? Different variables, we could call them in general. Every possible pair or in general, the equivalence class of, um, would be tested uh, pairwise together. So we're, is that number less than, or how does it compare with the set of all possible combinations? Suppose we, we, we want to combine, suppose we have 10 values, 10 values, 10 values, and we have five, we have six of them, we said it earlier. Suppose we have six possible, well, here, let's use this example. We have four possible fields. Suppose that each of these had 10 possible values. How many, how many combinations are there? If, if, imagine each of these browsers, suppose you had 10 browsers. Imagine you had 10 plugins for each possible browser, 10 servers, and 10 operating systems. How many total combinations are there? We did it exhaustively. 10, yeah, 10,000, 10 to the fourth, right? Hmm? 10 to the third is a thousand, 10 to the fourth is 10,000. Right? Right? Yeah. You comfortable with that? Yeah. I would hope it's computer scientists who become as comfortable with powers of two, but yeah. hope springs eternally. Um, <laughs> so, so we have 10 possible, 10 to the fourth possible combinations if we were exhausted, right? Let's suppose instead we wanted to test all pairs do you think it would be pretty similar or smaller than that so this is ten thousand we consider all pairs what would it be any anyone have a sense is it is it you know a bit smaller than it is it a lot smaller than that is it bigger than this Maybe yeah, it turns out that it the formula for it is this one here. Uh, um, so turns out in this case it would be a hundred possible times. Because remember, every test case 
just like here, every test case, this is one test case, right? This is a specific configuration of the system, right? It's a particular test case. Does it test just one pair of things? No, the answer is at one, it tastes, has several pairs. It has Netscape with, with no plugin. I said this earlier, but I'll emphasize it again. It has Netscape with IIS. That's another pair of possibilities. Check that off our pairs. You got to cover all pairs, but here in a single test case, we're testing, we can test a bunch of pairs. Okay. You see what I mean? A single test case can, can test pairs of this column and that one. One of those pairs is checked off our list. It says a pair of this one and this one. That's now checked off. We don't have to worry about that for later test cases. This pair of that one with Win2000, this pair of this one with this one is checked off our list. So with a given test case, we can actually check many pairs off our list. Do you get that basic gist? And so it turns out that it reduces by orders of magnitude the number of possibilities. From 10,000 to 100, which is, and 100 is 1% 1 of 100th of 10,000. So reduced it by a factor, in this case, of 100. You get that? And if you're manually configuring the system or spinning up virtual machines with a certain configuration with different browsers being used, or if you're doing writing manual tests or, or you know, you know Gherkins or you're, you're Putting together, putting together automated tests, going from 10,000 to 100 is a lot more manageable. Some of the systems we've shipped, you know, on the order of thousands of test cases, but they don't have, you know, tens of thousands or something like that. And so my point is that I'll be with you in just a second. Competent, if you consider all possible combinations, often it's just not possible to test all combinations, but you can test pairwise very effectively. And that matters because often problems come in pairs. Byte and log for J, right? Or byte and jest. Um, or, you know, a combination of a specific browser with a specific, you know, specific uh, emulator or something like that. Yes. So, I mean, maybe I may. Yeah. Okay. So in any logic field number lab field, you showed us mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. when we were trying to get the COVID-19 numbers that we, in the house, in the school. And yeah. The house. yeah. So one thing that I wanted to ask about, in the, depending on their environment and the kind of situation of other variables, things can change Change things. So for example, there might be a button set the program that alone it's not working, but when you pair with others, it will make it disappear. So in that case, are we taking it? Kind of missing the box. It's all those ones change. Like we are not kind of. I see what you're saying, but remember, you're testing. So, so with so, so this is a good point. So, let's suppose you were testing. Um, with bulls and provinces, right? If if you were testing for each province, does this work? You have one test case for each province. Um. And you also, if you guarantee you have one test case for each province. You have one, at least one test case for Saskatchewan, at least one for Newfoundland Labrador, at least one for BC, right? Um, and you have at least one when the Boolean is true and at least one where it's false. If, if you had those as your test cases, you're right that maybe the one you use for testing Saskatchewan happened to be with the Boolean being false, and that hit a bug that would have come up when it was true, if 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 the Boolean been true. But that's what pairwise testing guarantees. Pairwise testing guarantees you you have all possible pairs, not all possible combinations, but all possible pairs. Um, this is very different. So so here if we have three variables, and let's suppose that each um, each of these columns, for variable one, we have possibilities A, B, C, D, E, five. Variable two, we have A, J, K, L, M. That's five possibilities. Variable three, we have uh, W, or excuse me, V, W, X, Y, Z, right? Each of these has 
five combinations. How many combinations, if we tested exhaustively all possible pairs of these, all, oh, sorry, excuse me, all possible combinations of these, how many possibilities would there be? The formula is up over here. You just have to plug in the particulars. How many would there be? We have five for possibilities for the first, five for the second, five for the for the third, and, and we want to test all possible combinations. Five to the three power, right? Which is 125, right? We have to we have to test each of A, B, C, D, D, E. We have to test each of J, K, I, J, K, L, M, right? And so for each of the first five, we have to test each of the next five and each of the next five. So it's five to the three or 125. Do you get that? 125, right? Um, but if you were to look at the number of pairs associated with it, pairwise, if we were to test pairwise, I would tell you in this table, any given pair exists. Um, and how many total test cases are there in this table? 25. So that's one fifth of 125, right? So square. So sorry, I'm going to challenge you. You tell me. Maybe you don't believe all pairs are in there. So pick pick one of the possibilities, a variable. So which variables do you want to look? I, I, I'm gonna look, I, I'm gonna, you're gonna challenge pair watts uh, here. So um tell me which pair of variables uh you want to pick. One and three or two and three or or uh two and one. Which one? Give me give me a choice of, of two variables. Mm -hmm. Two, three, good. Okay, so now I'm gonna, you're gonna challenge me. Um, you, you pick a legal value for variable two, right? And then we're gonna pick a legal value for variable three. So pick a legal value for variable two. It either has to be, if you look at all the values in variable two, the possible values you can take on is I, J, K, L, F. So tell me one of those. Okay, good. K for variable two. And now pick one of the legal values for variable three, B, W, X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Z. Okay, so we're going to look. I say somewhere in this table, what should I be looking for? I'm looking for what? There's a test case that has what? K and Z. Somewhere in this table, one of those 25 have got to have K and Z for this to be an orthogonal array. Is there such a row? Yes, sir. Case 13, K and Z. Hmm? And that's not an accident. That's because this adheres to our orthogonal array. What this is, is a table of possibilities. It doesn't test all possible combinations. How do I know that? If this had to be all possible combinations, how many test cases would there be? 125. It doesn't test nearly all possible combinations, right? But it tests all pairs of combinations. Let's, let's, let's try it one more time. So let's pick another pair of variables. So you did two and three before. Give me another one. One and three. Okay. Give me possible value for one. Well, C. Okay, good. And give me a possible value for three. Could be the same one you used last time or a different one. And M. Oh, I'm sorry. No, for the third one. Oh, third one. For three. Which one? Y. Y. Okay. Could have said W is upside down. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so why? Okay. So C and Y. Is there a row? This is what we're going to check, right? Is there a test case that has C for I for, for table for variable one and which has uh, uh, Y for variable three? Test. Test. Well, right. Twelve. Uh -huh. So it is C and Y. And that's guaranteed. It's baked into it. That's why we came up with these illustrations. Are we testing all possible pairs of values? No. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Are we testing all possible combinations of values? No. Are we testing all possible pairs? Yes. Do you get that notion? And what I'm telling you is this is sensible testing because problems often come in pairs. They come with pairwise incompatibility. And from this dais, in the course of the semester, I've heard about many pairwise problems with your projects. 
like this technology doesn't play nicely well. We did a spike prototype to test how React works with fire with uh, Firebase, right? Um, we tested if React worked well with Playwright or what have you, or Playwright plays nicely with with VR or what have you, right? You 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 told me a lot about risks that were pairwise. Does this interact nicely with that? And that's what this tests. It tests, do they play nicely together? Do you get that sense? And so if you have a bunch of fields, you can't possibly test often all possible combinations for these, for different equivalence classes perhaps. But what you could do is make sure every darn pair is in there. And that's thoughtful test. It's not perfect. It's not exhaustive because testing is never exhaustive. But we could test that all possible pairs of values or equivalence classes are there. You notice I'm saying equivalence classes. Why do I say equivalence classes? Why not, why not say all possible pairs of values um, uh, you can test pairwise? Why is that? I can't do that. Yeah, I'm well, mapping. Uh, I think they say for text field, there are nearly infinitely many. Exactly. And so for test field, like, like two or subject, right? There's I mean, it, it, there's but there's no way we can even test it with all possible values of that string, right? I mean, realistically. But what we could do is delineate equivalence classes. We could say, well, we at least want to test it when subject is empty. We want to test it when subject has, you know, at, at least uh, alphanumeric characters in it. We might want to test it when it has unusual characters of different sorts uh, in it, maybe escape characters or maybe Unicode characters or what have you, you know, um, ones that aren't, well, you can define the equivalence classes. Earlier we talked about equivalence classes from this, from this dais, you know, a couple, we've, we've talked quite a bit about equivalence classes. I trust you could delineate some thoughtful equivalence classes for these. It's not perfect, but you could probably do a pretty good job you know, conjuring up some equivalence classes for a subject that would at least give it a run for its money, not leave money on the table, not not just obviously abdicate and flail and say, I don't, I don't know what to test it with. Yeah, you can figure out a couple of things you want to be sure to test, where if you didn't test with an empty string, someone would say, oh, come on, you haven't really tested this. You no, know, seriously. So you can figure those out for each of these. You'd want to test it some, you could test all possible you know, you could you could have it with attachment and without attachment, but generally, for a lot of things, we don't have the choice of all possible values of that in isolation. But we could at least check equivalence classes, and we can consider pairwise possible equivalence classes or values where possible, like has attachment or values of this, and make sure we test it with different combination, different pairwise combinations. Does that make sense? So. Big moral of the story here. Simple message. I'm gonna I'm on, I want to make sure this all sinks down. When we test, we've been talking about using boundary values between equivalence classes, between equivalence classes and boundary values between them. Think about for each field. But generally we have to deal with multiple variables or multiple fields, right? Not just one. And generally, you can't test all possible combinations of equivalence classes, all possible combinations of values. It, it's just not in the cards. Often it's too expensive or too onerous or what have you. And what are we to do? Well, you can still be thoughtful. You can still be judicious by testing pairwise. And that provides a strong guarantee. This is not all equivalence, this is not all possible combinations values, but it's a thoughtful subset of them. That if there's a problem with C and K, it's guaranteed it would be spotted because there's at least one test case with that combination, right? If there's a combination that E doesn't play nicely with, with Z, at least one test case will have that. And so you can rule out those things. Is it possible there's some weird error condition that depends on 
P for the first one, K for the second one, and X for the third one, you won't find yet. It kind of goes through the territory. But, but at least you're ruling out obvious pairwise problems. Does that make sense? Thoughtful testing. Don't flail. Don't just say, well, any, who knows? Be thoughtful. And, and there are utilities online that will generate orthogonal arrays. When I was a young man, we might have asked students to generate these things. But anyway, it's actually not that bad. It's actually a little bit fun if you give you insights into why each test case tests fails and why, therefore, you can get a real reduction in the, in the combination. But there are these online ones that will, will, will test it out. And you could see massive differences, right? Um, where you have all possible values 10 to the 15th versus 199. Is this a big difference or a small difference? Is it? It's a, it's, a, it's a big difference. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's right. Um, 10 to the ninth would be what, what's called here billion, right? 10 to six is million in North America. I'll be with you just a second, Daniel. 10 to the, so 10, 10 to the six is million, 10 to the ninth is billion, right? 10 to the 12th is trillion. And this is thick as quadrillion, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in Britain, by the way, lesson learned. Go work in the UK. Million and billion, I think, are used differently. And billion is, I can't remember what it is. Billion is used where million is used here or something like that. And 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 that's one of the reasons why it's good to be, to give, um, say, IE this number when you put documentation so you don't, deal with those different uh, meanings. But Daniel, yes. It is. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I mean, so that's right. So if you have on the hardware side, if you have different combinations of and, and depending what sort of hardware device you're dealing with, uh, you know, it could be different graphics cards with different, you know, otherwise components of the motherboard together with different amounts of memory, uh, can, together with different, um, you know, ethernet devices or whatever, like you could have different combinations. And the point is a given configuration could check off your list several different pairs, right? And so, yes, you might be able to test all pairs even with a smaller number of hardware configurations. And hardware configurations are might be expensive, right? To, to, to have them configured in this way. And this might be a parsimonious way to sensibly, judiciously, you know, bang for the buck, limit the number of configurations you have to put together to, te to guarantee testing that you've test all possible combinations of memory with this motherboard and all possible combinations of the different graphics cards you're considering or whatever with this motherboard. I'm I'm probably not using it for your area. I mean, it could be GPUs and the number of GPUs you, you have in place. But yes, it's a um uh it's it's definitely a possibility. It's one of those areas where testing it's not really, really easy to test large numbers of configurations. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. They can never cover all possibilities. And generally, we, we can't, right? Generally, we can't cover all possibilities, but we can at least not be stupid in our testing. We cannot be blind in our testing. We cannot leave open wide areas of our testing. And pairwise incompatibilities are one of the most common type of incompatibility. I see so much in my life, right? It's not A's problem by itself. It's not B's problem by itself. It's that they don't play well together, right? We see it a lot. Um, and there's a lot of tests rolling up uh, virtual machines. If you want to test your system on diff different virtual machines, um, you know, you like creating those takes some time. And so you you want to be thoughtful about, you know, having all pairs of things covered by different virtual machines. Um, uh, yes. Maybe it's the fact that you actually try to test like, and how people like randomly. Because yeah, we have it's like ten billion combinations. 
For for what type of test? For tax person at home. Is that the same kind of criteria that you have to confirm? Uh, I've never. Well, yeah. I mean, you. There are cases where, yeah, and it's an interesting comment, very interesting, Ardalan. You could look at, like, testing the compatibility of certain drugs in combination. Because one of the big problems with, I, I, I don't want to go on about this uh, too much in this class, but one of the big problems pairwise that we deal with in the world is, you know, this drug is okay by itself, but this drug paired with another drug may be problematic. So it's not... The drug by itself it's the drug in combination with another drug and there you might really want to check if you're going to roll out a new drug that it works really well with other common drugs because you don't want people you know who who have really adverse reactions just because they're on statins when they get prescribed this new weight loss drug right so you want to test it pairwise at least that's a very actually very 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 good uh comment yeah Okay, but I promised, and I promised none other, Ardalan, than you, that I would comment right. something about random testing. Now, this may sound weird. I say, don't flail, ladies and gentlemen, don't flail. But random testing involves, well, you could call it flailing, right? Like trying it out with different values. And sometimes it's not, you're not going to do this with hardware combinations. You're not going to do it with rolling out virtual machines. But you could do it where you have a function and you want to verify that it works well under a variety of values. And maybe you, you do all pairs. That's a good start. Great start. You've got all pairs. And then you want to test it with different randomly selected combinations of other ones, just to make sure you're not, you're not missing some things. And in fact, there's some really nice cases which can be they, they go into the case of what's called conform, a conformational random test. The idea is, suppose you have a square root function. Look, you want to be sensible about testing square root. Give me some values you, you of course, want to, or equivalence classes. If you have a square root, you, you give it a double, and and it's supposed to, you're, you're computing square roots of real numbers, so it, it should give, you know, a, a, a real number um, in response and it's only defined, uh, supposed to take values as arguments that are zero or larger. Suppose you had that. What are some values you want to test it with? Give me some values you might want to test a square root with. So I give you a square root. Okay, here's the square root. I want you, as part of your final exam, to test is this working today? What would you test with? What sort of thing? Well, negative number zero. Yeah. Uh, and also, like, numbers that have. Are, are the integers like no, no. Oh, okay? So integer, perfect. Maybe certain types of integers, perfect squares. You might want to test it with, or not. Or the one, the values that have like a radical or uh, like oh, absolute values in them, like different combinations. Yeah. yeah. So, so perfect squares, not perfect squares. What are two values you definitely want to check with? By the way, I said earlier, you're giving it a, a real number. So, so not giving it imaginary, it's a complex number. So I, I know, I, complex numbers are my friends. I feel your pain, <laughs> but, but let's keep it for now. Let's, let's just, because we have like minus one minutes left or something. Um, so what, what are two numbers? You got to take the square root out. Come on, folks. Uh, I, I'm going to get Tony back there. Zero and one. Terminal object. <laughs> uh, uh, you get my drift. Uh, yeah, so you want to test it because those are the fixed points. What do I mean by fixed point of square root? The, so the, the values of x such as square root of x equals this the, the, this this the, 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 Check what? What do you check? If you're taking a square root and you get a value, what can you do? 
square it and see if you get the original value, right? Or something within epsilon of the original value, something very, very close, right? Within tolerable error. That's confirmational random testing. You Maybe it's hard to take the square root. You have to do a lot of work. But if you give the value back and someone says, this is a square root of two, I could say, okay, I'll, I'll evaluate it for you. Tell me it's square root of two. I'll multiply it by itself and see if it's two, right? It's hard to draw it, but easy to check. And there's a set of values like this in the world where, look, we can't, sometimes we can't test that it's the right one, but we can at least test the possibility. So if I do a search on an airline site and I want to go from Saskatoon to Boston, mm -hmm. and it gives me back an itinerary, maybe I'm, I can't test it the best flight or whatever, but I can test, does it go like from A to B and B to C and, and C to D and, and get to Boston <laughs> at the end? Is it end to end, right? If it says, I will fly you to Winnipeg and, and then fly from Toronto to Boston, that's not a good trip, right? Um, so the point is we can check the properties of things given back. And we could say, is this, does it at least have plausible properties, right? If I say, take a, show me a bus trip from U of S to the airport, I want to at least check, does the road it show me, does it have no repeat stops? So I'm not going in circles. Does it start at the university? Does it end at the airport, right? Um, these are some basic properties you expect out of it. So generally we can try it with random numbers or random random, you know, uh, inputs and test properties of it. Maybe, maybe for the case of square root, you check, is it the square root? But in other cases, you just check, is this plausible? Does it have base plausibility? that this is a route from Saskatoon to Boston. Does it start from Saskatoon, does it end in Boston, is it end to end along the way? That it's contiguous, right? Um, that I could at least check. So I can check properties of things and I can test it randomly and, and that will have a certain variability. You got it? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always fun to talk with you. It's always enjoyable. Thank you for your time. And I'm looking forward to being with you on Tuesday to open up for you the world of coverage testing. Okay? That's our last day together with me talking to you. And then now, and you're going to talk with me. Remember, your stakeholders can come on Thursday. Yeah. Think about inviting them. Okay? Thank you, folks. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah.